Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Mary Chapman. I'm the Academic Director of the Public Humanities Hub. And I'd like to start by acknowledging that the University of British Columbia Vancouver campus, where the Public Humanities Hub team typically does much of its work, is located on the traditional ancestral territory of the Musqueam people. Of course, because of COVID, Hub staff and our guests today are not on campus, but elsewhere in the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations, where for millennia, Indigenous storytellers have shared stories about elders, leaders, and others who have come before. So I want to recognize this space as a place in which life stories have been shared and continue to be shared, because our hope today is that this panel on biography writing as public scholarship complements this tradition of crafting and sharing life stories on this land. The team that put together this programming today and our guests are uninvited visitors here. We're grateful to be here and we invite you to use the chat to acknowledge where you are today. So as many of you know, the Hub hosts book launch conversations and public scholarship presentations throughout the year. In fact, we have two additional events later today and tomorrow, a Massey Reads launch of books by Derek Gladwin and George Beliveau, professors in education, that concern arts-based approaches to well-being education. That's at 4.30 today. And tomorrow at 11 a.m., we have a Wikipedia as public scholarship panel. We'll put the links to these events in the chat. So you can explore our programming and view videotapes of any programming that you've missed at publichumanities.ubc.ca. Today's event is a kind of hybrid of our book launch um, uh, conversations and our public scholarship presentations. What we hope is to launch two important new biographies written by UBC humanities scholars and to offer inspiration to those in the audience who may be considering writing a biography. Our speakers today are two of the most accomplished biographers writing in Canada today. Now, if you were led to believe by the UBC events calendar that Philip Roth and Timothy Findlay would be here today, my sincere apologies. Alas, they are both deceased, but if anyone can bring Roth and Findlay back to life, our two authors, Cheryl Grace and Ira Nadell can. Department of English professor Emerita Cheryl Grace is one of Canlit's most esteemed scholars, a University Killam professor, an officer of the Order of Canada, a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, and past president of several academic associations, Cheryl's published hundreds of articles and over 20 books, including a biography of Canadian playwright Sharon Pollock. Her newest book is Tiff, A Life of Timothy Findlay, a portrait of one of Canada's literary treasures, published by Wilfrid Laurier University Press. Department of English Professor Emeritus Ira Nadell is another luminary in Canada's scholarly galaxy. A fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, a UBC Distinguished University Scholar, and the winner of numerous other awards, Ira has published over 30 books, including biographies of David Mamet, Tom Stoppard, Leonard Cohen, plus four books with San Francisco architect Donald MacDonald. His newest book is Philip Roth, A Counterlife, a profile of the prolific American novelist published by Oxford University Press. We will share links in the chat to sites where you can purchase these books. And we also invite you to pop questions you would like to ask our three guests today in the chat. Cheryl and Ira are joined on our virtual stage by our moderator, Manel Matani. Manel is Associate Professor at the Social Justice Institute at UBC, Senior Advisor to the Provost on Racialized Faculty, and an accomplished scholar. Earlier in her career, Manel was a national television news journalist at CBC and a journalism and geography professor at University of Toronto. 
Some of you may have heard Manel on Acknowledgements, a popular program on Roundhouse Radio on which Manel asked authors about those they thanked in their acknowledgements. This simple question unlocked many of the secrets of the books these authors had just written, where their ideas started, who helped along the way, and how. how. Minnell is a master at getting authors to open up about the secrets of their craft, so we're absolutely thrilled to have her join us today. Minnell will moderate the discussion with Cheryl and Ira, but promises to save time at the end for your questions. So I'll turn it over to her now. Minnell. And I'm just so happy to see so many of you able to join us today. It's a real uh, wonderful opportunity and a cause for celebration for uh, these two books. I want to start with this today. It's a quote from Tim Tim Timothy Finley, The Wars. You will live when you live. No one else can ever live your life and no one else will ever know what you know. It really made me think about whether or not a biographer can ever truly know his subject's story and what does it really mean to spend hours meticulously researching a life. I think our two authors today can really speak to these questions quite profoundly, Cheryl Grace and Iron Needle. I'm going to talk a little bit about how they approach telling the life story of their subject and the places their research has taken them and welcome both of you. I'm so delighted to speak with both of you. Thank you. Uh, I want to start with this. I want to ask you both about motivations, like what led you to actually write these books. Cheryl, I want to start with you. You're obviously an expert in Canadian literature, as Mary has already so aptly attested to. So I guess in some ways it kind of made sense that you'd want to learn more about the life of a great Canadian writer. But I want to hear more specifically about what drew you to write this biography. And you suggest somewhere at the very beginning of your book that it came to a head in 2007 when you were teaching. Can you tell us about that moment? I can, and it's a moment I will treasure. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, I was already interested in the craft, the crafty art, if you will, of biography, uh, life writing. I would thought about it a lot, but I hadn't thought about Timothy Finley. I was teaching this graduate seminar on Finley, and they were students, it was a good class of students, and they would have been in their mid-twenties, maybe a little older, but you know, certainly a lot younger than I am, and they really gravitated to Finley in an interesting way, and, and on a very visceral level, uh, I would say almost on a very personal level, and this surprised me. I expected color, scholarly engagement, of course. He, he is a rich writer to analyze if you're in a PhD program in an English department. Uh, but they were doing that, but they were also relating to him in other ways that uh, really grabbed my attention. And they had questions for me that I couldn't answer. The questions tended to revolve around, well, you know, why did he do this? And who was he? And what led him to have this interest and that interest? And, and that meant I had to start looking around to see if I could answer their questions. And there wasn't much out there in the way of biographical work on Finley to really help me answer them. But when people that age have that kind of engagement, any reasonable professor or teacher should be paying attention and saying there's something here they need to work with. And that really is what inspired me. I couldn't answer their questions and I wanted to be able to. And then I wanted to know from them what it was that so captured them. Um, their emotions, um, they, the discussions were so lively in the seminar, so heated, passionate, and um, I think really that came clear for me with the novel Headhunter, which is a very difficult novel, very challenging, very difficult novel, not my favorite Finley novel by, by quite a bit. And they felt that they were inhabiting a world now or then, you know, a few years ago, which resonated with what he was describing in that novel. The interests that he had in war, in censorship, in bigotry, in the rise of fascist thinking, uh, ideologies around the world, they were all attuned to this kind of thing. And here was this writer they had never 
not read before, hadn't read much before, who was addressing these issues in ways that um, really, really got to them. So two things then, he, yes, he's a great writer, but they were engaged, they had questions. And secondly, they related to him in a way that surprised me and pleased or delighted me, although it's sad in a way because the issues he's addressing are such serious issues, climate change, um, racism, sexism, censorship, bigotry, um, and of course the constant presence of war. Small wars, yeah, we haven't had another big one yet. Um, the environment, they were all environmentalists and maybe all or many young people are these days, but they really appreciated the things that he was talking about and warning society about. So, you know, really it was, in, I'll never forget that seminar that we, uh, or the individuals who were in it. It was a very exciting moment for me. It's the most satisfying thing is, as when you're teaching to have that kind of circularity goes out and it comes back and you learn yourself while they're learning. And it was an amazing experience. So that's too long an answer, but that's the why. No, but that's, I mean, you know, Cheryl, it so speaks to who you are as a person, not just as a writer, but also as a scholar, right? The fact that you were so open to understanding the motivations of your students that it led you to look at the motivations of his own life. And it also just speaks to how much you care to answer the questions that your students had that you went and investigated and looking at your own questions around Finley's life. So I want to thank you for that. Um, Ira, I want to ask you a very similar question too. I mean, you know, you're no stranger to this field of biography. I mean, looking at all the work you've done on Leon Uris, a biography on David Mamet, and of course, Leonard Cohen. And Apart from the obvious New Jersey connection, I mean, you were born there, and of course, Roth has such deep connections with New Jersey. Tell me what drew you to exploring the life of Philip Roth so deeply. Well, I think it's a great question, and my reply is going to be much more superficial <laughs> than uh, Cheryl's, and possibly more comic, because uh, during my PhD oral defense, a book called Portnoy's Complaint had recently been published. And I had some very esteemed people on my defense committee, starting with the venerable M. H. Abrams, the general editor of the Norton Anthology. And I'm prepared to discourse on George Eliot and Thomas Carlyle and renunciation. And we get underway and uh, Mike Abrams interrupts and he says, before we go too far, tell me about this book. I'm sure you read it called Portnoy's Complaint. Well, of course I had read it. So I have to say 75% of my oral defense was on Philip Roth. Oh no. Now, <laughs> it, was, it was a moment and biography back then was to me a, a very significant genre that I was trying to understand. I was also working with someone named Arthur Meisner. He wrote the first biography of F. Scott Fitzgerald, and he was working on the biography of Ford Maddox Ford. And what intrigued me was why are people interested in biography and why do people write biography? And so the first critical effort of mine was a book that addressed that called Biography, Fiction, Fact, and Form. And after dealing with that, I thought maybe it's time to try and write a biography. And so I kind of got started and have gone that particular road. More directly with Roth, in an odd way, I think you could say I grew up with Philip Roth. He's older. But I had similar New Jersey experiences. When he writes about Newark, I had been to Newark. My mother was born in Newark and grew up in Newark. I, I don't want to say I went to Minsky's burlesque, but I <laughs> stared at the posters just as Roth has his characters. And so over the years, I was always reading Roth. I had met him several times. And then I did a kind of reference book on Philip Roth. And then I thought, why not undertake biography of Philip Roth? And in a way, that's how it started. But I find these biographical projects evolve and they're quite organic. I certainly didn't know what I wanted to say about Philip Roth when I started. And certainly the published uh, uh, account of Philip Roth 
is very different than what I expected to write about. But every biography is a fascinating journey and every biography uncovers, it always possesses surprises and discoveries. And I'm sure Cheryl can speak to that very extensively. And I too encountered surprises. I'll just digress for one second. Here's an example of a surprise. Uh, when I was writing the biography of Tom Stoppard, I had dinner with his first serious girlfriend. As one does, uh, we were, Ira. As well, one. Yes, how do you like that? Uh, and it was in Bristol. And we got on very well. And so after listening and we're enjoying each other's company, she says, I have something for you you might want to read. And she reaches down, I disappear and pull up a bunch of love letters that were in her possession from Tom Stoppard when he first went to London after being a critic in Bristol. And they were astonishing. They were about Peter O'Toole and Harold Pinter and all these wonderful people. So this is why I like to do biography because you never know what's on either the next page or the next interview with people. You know, I love where we're going with this because there's so much here that we're getting at around geography and the surprises. So I think we're going to have some really a lovely, continue this really beautiful conversation. Um, Cheryl, I want to, you know, play off that a little bit with you. You know, you told me it took you 10 years to write this book. And, you know, you never met Finlay, but you said something was always in the back of your mind while you were writing. The words of Finlay himself, who said, and here's a quote, the creation of any successful biography involves encounters with any number of nightmares for a writer, facts that can't be verified, people you need to interview who die two days before you arrive, keepers of the flame who refuse to divulge the one vital thing you must have access to. <laughs> Do you think Finley summarizes the hurdles a biographer has to face with accuracy here? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And I've experienced all of those hurdles and more. You know, so far, Ira and I have made this sound like almost a romantic adventure that one goes on. And there are many adventures in writing a, a biography, and they're always different depending on who your subject is. But there's another side to it. And uh, that other side is long, lonely time writing. Uh, there are practical things one has to see to, one has to have grants to travel, uh, one has to have funding uh, and support, and one has to have permissions. And then once one has those things in place, you sit down, you know, you gather the information and then you sit down by yourself for hours and write and rewrite and rewrite again and again. Uh, so yeah, Tiff, Tiff and uh, for people who don't necessarily know, T I double F was his nickname, and his family used it, his friends used it, and after much debate, we finally used it on the cover of the book, and that's the way he would sign his letters. So that actually is one of his signatures <laughs> blown up that appears on the cover of the book. But sure, you, um, you have to be careful about the people you interview. They can have surprises for you but they can be very biased in what they want to tell you. They can sometimes wish that you were writing their biography instead of the biography of the person you want. <laughs> so, um, you know, there are, there are a lot of hurdles and a lot of lonely long work that goes into writing a biography. And I would not suggest a really young person starting out in their career to undertake a big biography. It takes too long. And the system in universities is such that you need to, to um, show your productivity uh, more quickly in a career. I felt that I needed to cut my teeth back in the 90s on letters. And I did two volumes of La uh, Malcolm Lowry's letters. And that is another form of life writing. In the case of Finley, um, I had some fantastic adventures, especially in field, what I call field, field work, Manel. Uh, I love going to archives and working. I did that as my as a PhD student. I've done it all my life with most of the books I've written, with all of them maybe. But field work is really the adventure, par excellence. So I had to go to many countries in Europe, uh, the States, across Canada, and especially to a, a, almost a sacred place for Finley, 
called Stone Orchard in Southern Ontario, in a, just outside a little town called Cannington, about two hour, two hour drive north of Toronto. So uh, that place, Stone Orchard was an old farm, which he and his partner, Bill Whitehead, renovated, where they kept their cats, their dogs, their horses, where he walked in the fields. That place inspired almost everything he wrote after they moved there. So I went many times and um, walked in those fields, went through that house, the people living there, very generous, and um, tried to really almost inhale the space in which he created his work. What's, what inspired him about these fields, the woods over there, the Beaver River over there, the blue barn on the other side of the road. Uh, these all appear in his fiction. But unless you do the field work, you don't get that, that visceral connection with the work. Carol, I'm gonna push, I wanna hear a little bit more about that because there's one moment that really took my breath away. You said that you had returned to Stone Orchard, Timothy Finley's home, as you just told us, many times over the course of doing the research for this biography, but you said that one damp November day remained with you. Can you tell us why? Well, it was my first visit and uh, the people, I was meeting the people who now own the place for the first time and this had all been arranged. They knew I was coming and they were welcoming and, and greeted me, my husband was with me. And um, they, they basically gave us free range, they gave me free range to, to, I could go anywhere on the property. They invited us in, they invited me to go upstairs to see where his study was um, the colors that were still on the wall that they hadn't repainted, uh, the kitchen where he and Bill sat. So the living room, I, I have pictures of. They, they changed the living room and there wasn't a piano anymore and there weren't the same number of bookshelves and so forth. But it was like stepping into his life because I knew what he had written about and here was so much of it. Not just indoors, by the way, mostly outdoors, I think. And I grew up in central Canada, not in beautiful BC. So I felt very emotional on that first visit because I felt I was returning to something in me that signaled my own roots, where I grew up, where I walked as a young person, as a child. Um, it, it felt like I had come home in some very strange way. So it was a very, very interesting and memorable occasion. And after that, the other trips there were also very good, including the last one I made. Sounds like you I wanted the biography to find out about the last <laughs> one I made, where again I went into the fields. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, these, these, the way that you capture that sense of place, I mean, looking at all the stories you tell about his experiences in Toronto were so vivid to me, and I so appreciated that about the way you capture his life in that way. You know, Ira, I wanna ask you a little bit about your process because it's similar, but it's also different too. I think it's been said that uh, there's your philosophy has been one that biographers need not interact with their subjects, but that you do need to appreciate their subjects worth. And I think more specifically that a biographer should tell the reader who the subject is, not what the subject has achieved. Seems like a really hard balance to strike. Tell me how you do that. Well, that is a complex thing. And when you start your research for a biography, you don't know where you're going, to be quite honest. I mean, you know, you, this person lived for a while in Rome, or they lived in Newark, or they lived um, in Woodstock, New York, or his home in rural Connecticut. Um, it comes to you as you become more familiar with the details of that life. And I think what you look for are certain characteristics, possibly even patterns. And I keep thinking about Virginia Woolf, who in 1927, in a review in the Times Literary Supplement, has a wonderful sentence where she talks about the biography shouldn't be about what has changed in a person's life, not what has happened. And for me, that's a quite a resonant sentence because it's the difference between a chronology and a biography. For me, biography is interpretive, it's analytical. It's what does this person's life mean? 
at least to me as the biographer, as opposed to what did the person do. And I would describe my effort with Roth as a critical biography. And right from the preface, it tells you that this is a biography of his emotional history. This is the backstory of the public life of Philip Roth. Of course, I talk about the public life, but I also talk about the psychological input that shaped his various novels over a very long life. He lived to the age of 85. Um, and that requires a different kind of thinking. Of course, I spent lots of time in uh, archives, particularly the Library of Congress, where his main archive is, uh, and time tracking down people and speaking to them. But the wonderful thing, to come back to surprise, is that one of Roth's many, I will say, lovers, out of the blue contacted me, and we became actually partners in the process of writing this life. I never, I didn't even know where this, I knew she was alive, I didn't know where, and I'm not even sure how she found me, but it doesn't matter. And her insights and her commentary on about, if you can imagine, a 22 year relationship, most of it quite private with Philip Roth were just remarkable. And then she told me about semi-public events um, that we, we, meaning the public, didn't have a very clear idea of. This doesn't exist on paper, okay? I cannot send you to the New York Public Library to find this. And so, again, this is the discovery of biography. But just as Cheryl said a moment ago, you finally face the page or the screen and you have to figure out what is the story that you are going to tell and from what perspective? And that's why I briefly want to comment about beginnings because beginnings to me are essential. Um, I look for an event to start the biography and that event can be the person is 62 years old or 22 years old. I do not want to start a biography historically the great grandparents came over in 1879 on a ship called, and on that ship there were 870 passengers. That's history, that's all very good, but that's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in a moment that somehow is a signature for the life of that individual. And I also believe there will never be a definitive life of your subject, which is why you need to have multiple lives of the same person. Count the number of biographies of Virginia Woolf or Charles Dickens. I think that it's better to have more lives than assume there is just one. I want to, in, I want to intrude on this because you've said, Ira, um, used a couple of terms that I think are really, really important for anybody who wants to think about writing biography. And the word that I would stress over and over again is story. You can collect all the facts in the world and you need them because you have to be accurate. But you, and when you sit down to write, you have to tell a story. Your reader uh, doesn't want dry facts. They want, you know, an adventure, a story. So you create a story out of all the research that you've done and you try to be as accurate in anything you say. But there's one big caveat on that, which uh, you didn't quite mention, and I think it's crucial, but it, it, you implied it when you said there should be <clears throat> multiple lives, and that is you have to be prepared to say, I don't know. You have to be prepared to say, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. And uh, I love that not knowing because there's room for many lives of a great writer or a great artist or, or a great politician, but you have to admit to not having a particular piece of information that you might like to have. I mean, it just may not be available to you. It may be withheld from you, uh, whatever. Uh, but um, it, it's, it, it is an important feature of this storytelling that is my storytelling, Ira's storytelling. I even think, Ira, that the photographs shape that story. I don't know about you, but I've had 
hundreds of photographs about or of Finlay, I had to choose 35 because it's a one volume <laughs> biography. But, you know, I've looked at them many times and I realized as I was selecting them, Cheryl, this selection is shaping the story. Absolutely. It's yeah. my story about Timothy Finley, although these are documents, facts, if you will. I know. Well, I'll confess that I often, or I did, lurk in many biographies, sorry, in many bookstores in the biography section to see what do people do when they pick up a biography? And it's no surprise, what's the first thing they do is they look for pictures. And the pictures begin to tell that story that you're describing. And then if they think there's something interesting, they may actually- They might buy the book. <laughs> well, they might at least read a page of text. Yeah. But yeah. it's really the photograph, the visual that pulls the reader into the book. And that's why I also think covers, book covers are so significant. You have a great cover. I mean, I did, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's very good. So I guess it's time for me to show my cover if people haven't seen it. And it's a photograph of a scowling <laughs> Philip Roth sitting in an Eames, Eames chair in his New York apartment with a pile of books. And I'm already getting some uh, queries about the significance of the books that are piled up here next to him. The first is called War and the World. And of course, my book is subtitled A Counter Life. So it has a certain edge to it. Um, but covers Covers are important. Me. Covers are important. Yeah, and that's why we settled on this. Yeah, really. Yeah. 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 An attractive design. And that's shaping him too just as you're shaping oh, sure. Roth. Um, yeah. And uh, I think we need to be as, uh, an, as you are, and I hope I've been as well, really honest about that, that um, I can't know this, so I won't speculate. And it's really wrong to read the work back into the life of a writer or an artist. Uh, and that, that well, happens, I, but it shouldn't. And I'm, yeah. not, I'm not sure I would agree with you the word is wrong, I think there is certainly a tendency, and if we look at the comparative history of 20th century biography, there was a period in the 50s and 60s when, say, Richard Ellman wrote his biography of yeah. Joyce, yeah. when Gordon Haight wrote his biography of George Eliot, and these were scholars who were undertaking biography, Leon e. Dell, his life of Henry James, and their technique was to read the life into the work and the work into the life. That was really how, you know, they kind of got started. Things are, you know, we have multiple approaches today, but it's not wrong. It's just, it's one way to treat the life. Yeah, I have to be very careful, especially with anything psychological. And of course, there were issues in Finley's life as a gay man at a time. Sorry, Manel, we've taken over, haven't we? Yes, Manel, it's nice of you to be there. Well, you know, this is the beauty, right? Yeah. To hear you both speak to one another. I mean, this is the beautiful thing about the ways in which these biographies speak to each other. There's just so many similarities and points of connection. And I think you've touched upon one right now around the emotional life of both these men, which really leads me to a question around the stories that these men heard from other men and how they actually spoke to their therapist about their experiences. And uh -huh. then, uh, in, my, in my case, of course, the uh, uh, the really wonderful psychiatrist who was a friend of Finley's, Ed Turner, Dr. Edward Turner, um, those records are destroyed. You don't get to look at those records. What I had instead, uh, and it caused me some dismay, was thousands of pages of personal journals that Timothy Finley started in his teens and was writing up until two weeks before he actually uh, was taken to hospital, not before he died, but because he didn't come out of hospital. They were in France, he and Bill Whitehead at that time. And um, Bill Whitehead gave me access to absolutely everything in Library Archives Canada, uh, all the restricted materials, thousands of pages of journals. Can you just tell people who Bill White is, is for people who might not know? Oh, yeah. Well, I, you know, I was thinking of Bill when um, Mary said that your question on another occasion had been, who, who did you acknowledge? 
Yeah, I, um, the late Bill Whitehead, the late really wonderful Bill Whitehead uh, was Finley's partner. Uh, they met in 1962 and um, the rest is history, as one says. They moved up to Cannington and bought Stone Orchard a few years later. And Bill, who was working for the CBC, was a scientist. That's what his uh, university education had been. And um, very different temperament from Finley's and it balanced him very well. I claim in the biography that there wouldn't have been the author to Timothy Finley if there hadn't been a Bill Whitehead. And I would now say that there wouldn't be my biography of Timothy Finley without a Bill Whitehead. So the first thing I did when I made up my mind that I might try to do this was to go to Stratford and meet Bill Whitehead. And depending on what happened in that meeting, I would say yes or no. And he met me at the door of his apartment with arms spread. He had baked a special pear tort for me. And there was lots of good red wine and the rest of, was a 10 year history. The wonderful thing about Bill Whitehead, Manel, is that he never interfered. I think that's remarkable. He did, never told me to change anything. He never blocked me in any way. He told me about their private life, intimate details of their private life, which are not recorded in Finley's journals. Um, the, the journals, his journals are another thing in themselves, I mean, just extraordinary gold mine. But Bill Whitehead, really ran the show. He, once he left the CBC, his job in life was to be there for him. And, um, and then he gave me access to everything, which was, you know, remarkable and essential. That's Bill Whitehead. I miss him. You know, he, uh, he read a penultimate draft before he died and he called me and, um, we had a very brief, he was very ill with cancer. We had a very brief conversation and, and we hung up and I treasure that moment very much. I was very lucky, you know. Um, You're both yeah. lucky, right? I mean, Ira, you too, having that serendipitous moment to have the ability to access all this incredible information really made such a big difference, right? To the way in which you could actually begin to tell this particular story. Uh, absolutely, but it's a different kind of story with Philip Roth. Right. Philip Roth sought throughout his whole life control. Mm. Even after he died, he was and has left directions and guides and instructions about how to tell his story. <laughs> and there is an official biographer named Blake Bailey, whose book is coming out in about two or three weeks. I know Blake. Um, the books are very different, although I haven't read a great deal of his yet. And one way you can measure the difference is size. Blake's book is over 900 pages. Mine crests at around 500. I call my book a svelte biography <laughs> of Philip Roth. Now, but more specifically and more interestingly, in the last three or four years of Philip Roth's life, he began to write these not quite journal entries as, as Cheryl has described, but these essays, uh, very personal. And there are 400 pages collectively called Notes for My Biographer. And they're broken up into money. You know, a lot of people disliked the fact that he had made a lot of money and we don't know what he did with it. Another, and this really surprised me, he has a, um, an essay <clears throat> where he lists with their annotated lists of every woman that he had relationships with. And believe me, there's, it's a long list, okay? But it's like mini biographies and the nature of their relationships. I can't imagine too many people in their late 70s, early 80s remembering this, but he had this material. So this material is a gold mine but it has a very interesting history in and of itself because no one can see it now. It was gifted, he made three copies. One was for Blake, 
One was to a very close friend of his, and he said to this friend who's a, a teacher writer in New York, you know, this is important. And if you, at some point in your life, want to realize some capital from this material, you have my permission, you can sell it. And this person, about 18 months after Roth died, sold his archive to a library. And I got wind of this and went to that library about three weeks after they received the material and they treated it like any serious substantial archive. They had quickly done a finding list. You can read this if you want to make some copies, you can do it, not more than X, Y, Z. I left and two weeks later, the archive shut down and it is still embroiled in a legal hassle. So it's a window that I was fortunate enough to step into. Now, obviously you can't cite from a lot of this, material. you can't quote from this, but I can talk about it. And one of the most important documents is a complete history of his health. Philip Roth had terrible health starting issues, really beginning at the age of 10. But in the latter part of his life, we're talking about heart disease, we're talking about vascular disease, we're talking about multiple stents, and he really never made that very public. People close to him knew about this. And this again, lends a different, uh, what, what's the metaphor, perspective to Philip Roth, because he writes a lot. His last books are about illness. They're about polio, and they're about suicide, and they're about depression. And we could go on for a very long time about psychology and his psychiatrists. This is interesting, Manel and Ira, because what Roth did just sounds so different from what Finley did. He too, he too wrote autobiography, and um, in his novels, there is always a journal. Somebody is keeping a journal, and or somebody oh. is you know, commenting on a found journal. I mean, that kind of sense of biography, autobiography, journal is uh, journaling, journal writing within the fiction, is throughout. But in his own autobiography, Inside Memory. Mm -hmm which I highly recommend to anybody interested in, in, in memoir. What he does, and I, I don't know if I can quote him precisely, but he says, a person's life is more about the people they knew than the person themselves. I'm paraphrasing. He said it more eloquently than that. And sure enough, if that guy didn't tell stories about other people in his life as he goes through his life, and instead of saying something about himself, but you, mm -hmm. you, you can see around the edges, he's peeking, he's performing, he's peeking out, you get a sense of who he is, even though he's not telling you, damn it, the stories of his life, but of theirs, with one outstanding, well, there's more than one, but there's one outstanding exception. And that's when he saw, he was in the home of someone, uh, Ivan Moffat in uh, uh, California, and, um, Moffat gave him permission to look through his bookshelves and he came upon a collection of photographs that Ivan Moffat had made when the American army liberated Dachau. And in that episode in Inside Memory, he actually will say that although he knew about Dachau, he had no idea and that it had infected him in such a way that he would never be the same again. Mm -hmm. And so echoes of that incredible experience are going to come up over and over again. But he doesn't do that often. He's usually telling somebody else's story. And he's in, you know, he's backstage or in the wings. <laughs> and you have to sort of wonder what, why he's telling you this. It's a fascinating structure for, uh, for an autobiography or a memoir. Yeah, really, really interesting. I just want to jump in and say Roth, again, is very different because Roth is always about himself, yes. and it's only about himself. Yeah, and only not so. interesting yeah. Yeah. characteristic yeah. of his socialization is that he would create friendships and end them. Oh. And he was very sensitive. If you ever wrote, as John Updike did, a critical note about one of... 
Roth's novels, in this case, it was Operation Shylock, he would probably never speak to you again. And Updike compounded the error because after that book review, in one sentence, he basically praised Claire Bloom and her autobiography, Leaving a Doll's House. And that ended a, almost a lifetime of certainly friendship association between the two. So much so that seven years, seven years after John Updike died, Roth is still, was still writing nasty things about him in public and in print. So, Billy did not do that. Isn't it interesting? I know, he, he I know. He maintained his friendships and he treasured them even when he was in his most, you know, despair over the human race and the human species. He always found his friendships and he, he treasured them and he preserved them. And you can see him writing about them in the journals. There are letters, of course, to Margaret Lawrence, to Alec Guinness, and you know. But yeah, no, he he maintained all of that, just the way he kept all his journals and all his memorabilia. Um, uh, in a yeah. memoir of Rod, in a memoir of Rod, someone had a great phrase that he was always litigating the past. Oh, no, not, not, not Finley. Yeah, so different, so different. Fascinating, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You know, there's Your so chance, Pinnell. All right, well, Pinnell. <laughs> that's the whole point, right? The, the, you both embarked upon this journey, and the fact that you can speak to each other about it in such a generative way is really exciting for me. So I'm so happy that we have a chance to do that. And I want to remind everybody who's listening in to feel free to jump in with questions. I mean, we're going to open it up in a little while. So each one of you, I'm sure a lot of you have some burning questions for our esteemed guests today. So you should totally feel free to, to get ready to share some of your questions with us, because I know that we'd really like to hear them. Um, I've got a little surprise for both of you, actually. It's something that's been on my mind, and I think it won't come as a surprise to either one of you particularly, because Mary just said that I had this show called Acknowledgements. Um, Ira, I was really struck by one of the acknowledgements in your book, and I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about what you said about um, one of the people who you said was really supportive of your work, um, Michael Early, who is a professor in Singapore. Um, yeah. Tell us why it was that you thanked him, because you say that he's a, been a long time of supportive friend as well as a valuable agent provocateur. I wanted to know if you could okay. tell me. Okay, Michael is a fascinating figure who worked for the BBC for many years as head of drama. And I first met Michael when he was the publisher of Methuen in London. And he published my Tom Stoppard book. And we have remained very good friends ever since. He moved out of publishing into academia. He has a degree from Yale and ran a very important theater school in London as the principal for about 12 years, and then took a similar post in Singapore. But Michael is at heart a, a true publisher in the sense that he asks very critical questions about the project, about its evolution. Of course, he's also an editor. And I think with any project, and biographies are long-term projects, you need to find an outside voice, someone who understands more or less what you're trying to do, but knows how to deflate the balloon. And that balloon is my idea of how I think the story should be told, neglecting all this material over here. And there was also someone else that I cite in the acknowledgments, a writer from New York named Jesse Tisch, who definitely knows how to deflate the balloon. And I find these people instrumental, not in the where do I go to find the materials, but just as we were saying 15 minutes ago, how do you write it? What do you do? What approach do you take? You, you think you understand what you're doing, but very often you're not. And so those two people, Michael in particular, but also Jesse, played a really critical role. And I have found with the other lives I've written, there's always someone kind of on the edge who provides that particular uh, role. And they can be, I remember working on David Mamet, it was a journalist from Chicago, okay, who did the theater beat. And I would go to Chicago a great deal. Uh, with Leonard Cohn, it was Leonard Cohn. Mm. He <laughs> raised so many questions. And why are you saying that, he would say to me, uh, in his very polite, you know, manner. So I find that uh, essential. But again, these are people 
I didn't know they were going to play that role when you begin the project. And I think, Cheryl, you did a brilliant thing, the first step in talking to, you know, White Law. And without but the other people, the other people who were wonderful in my work were Susanna, and I'd like to name them, Susanna Egan. Of course. Uh, yeah. who is a, 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 a biography theorist and uh, read the entire thing at one point, and a very dear friend in Baltimore who also read the entire thing and gave me feedback, you know, and asked me questions and said, well, why this? And what about that? And uh, I remember Kay Edgington wanting to know more about uh, Sebastian, the toy bear that uh, Timothy Finley kept kept all his life and gave strict instructions that when he was cremated, Sebastian was not to be cremated with him. So Sebastian uh -huh. can be found in an archive at Guelph University as tawdry, ragged looking little teddy bear. Um, so there was, a, you know, yeah, you, you need those sorts of people. I also had a wonderful research assistant I'd like to name, Erin Ramlow. And Erin was wonderful to bounce ideas off of. She was in that one of those seminars on Finley and um, stayed with me through much of the process and, and traveled with me to archives. And yeah, it's, um, it's not, I, it is lonely, isn't it, Ira? It has to be lonely at some point, but then there are these wonderful exchanges with marvelous people along the way that sort of make up for the hours alone, yeah. Well, you know, yeah. before, and one thing I wanted to make sure that we did is, you know, I reached out to Michael, actually, Ara, just to find out what role he played and how he felt about that. And one of the things he said about you is that you're an extraordinary dogged writer and academic, that you like subjects who have led double lives, as all of us do, and that your gift is that you find new paths to an individual's hidden truth, often by means of what his subjects would rather remain hidden about their past or achievements. Ira knows how to- He doesn't know what he's talking about. Oh, I think you should take the praise, Ira. This is all uh, true. And I think it's lovely that he feels this way about you to know that someone really, you know, captures your essence in this way. He said that you know how to untangle deliberate obfuscation and troubled past and comb out some new truths and lots of secrets. And you can't do this without shifting through the strands of a troubled, doubled persona. He also said that you are like two Jersey boys who both like Roth. And I just love that. That's that true. That's about true. You. So, yeah. But I didn't know that about Michael when I first met him. Yeah. Well, clearly that was something that you both That's had. That's very in sweet. Thank you. Yeah. And, you know, Cheryl, I also noticed with you that you thank John Pierce, who's no a stranger to the, to the Public Humanities Hub. As a lot of you will know, John Pierce is one of the agents for one of the most prominent literary agencies in Canada, Westwood Creative Agents. Um, and he played a very important role in your book as well, as you obviously know. One of the things he said about your book is he says it's a treasure. And as Timothy Finley's editor for The Wars and Famous Last Words, I can attest to its accuracy, poignancy, sensitivity and formidable research. A told, total portrait in the round and a rich complex recreation of a man I loved and treasured working with. And he just really said that the work that you've produced here is truly brilliant. And I just wanted to share that with you as well. Oh, I didn't know that John had said that. That's so nice. Thank you for telling me that. We've had many conversations, of course. Yeah. Oh, that is so, so dear. That's dear. Uh, yeah. Good. So glad. Um, I want to make sure I throw it open to questions to the audience. I have so many more things I'd love to ask you, but I can see that we do have questions here from people who would like to share some of their thoughts and, and their uh, questions that they've been burning to ask. And we have one here from Linda Mora. Let me share it with you. How did you decide what is the definitive moment, the one that defines the life you wanted to tell? Did the moment you select change as each of you wrote the biography? And Cheryl, why don't we start with you? I think Finley, in a sense, identified those moments for me. I just had to find them. And one of them had to be seeing those photographs of Dachau. Uh, I don't know if you've read Famous Last Words, but it's about uh, the end of the Second World War and fascism. I think it's his masterpiece. I think it is a masterpiece that I would rank with um, uh, Ulysses and Under the Volcano and Absalom, Absalom. I mean, that uh, it's a marvelous book. Um, and he makes that very clear. So that was a gift. The other, uh, one other, I'll just tell you one other important moment was reading those 
early journals from the 50s. He was in London, England, trying to be an actor and keeping these journals and, uh, and struggling with the fact that he wasn't successful, but he knew he was an artist and he hated the theater, but what could he do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then he starts realizing that perhaps he's not an actor, that perhaps he's a writer. So there is, and I describe this in the biography, there is this, what I would say is a kind of eureka or aha moment. And I came across this in a journal, 1954 journal. I said, oh my God, you finally, finally understood who you are uh, and what you want to be and where your talents lie. And um, that was a marvelous discovery in those private journals, which uh, uh, he kept, and I have to assume he kept for somebody like me to come along and read. Uh, there are other moments like that in his life. Uh, another one I will single, uh, signal out for you uh, without giving too much away in the biography was when he went up to the Yukon. Uh, he and uh, he was uh, commissioned, or he and Bill had been commissioned to write something about um, Pierre Burton's uh, uh, studies of the, of the North and of the Yukon and the Gold Rush. And he had one of these moments up there when he was coming back down. I don't know, it's hard, it would take me a long time to describe how difficult it was at that time to get into the Yukon if you started from the ocean side, the way the, the gold miners did with the pack animals. And then the danger is coming back down. I mean, it was a nightmare of a thing to do. And he has a moment when he discovers a cemetery, a small cemetery for the horses and mules who were sacrificed to human greed. And that moment then will stay with him and he will come back to that moment in his novel, The Wars, in Not Wanted on the Voyage and uh, actually de dedicate, there's a dedication to the, the 200. And uh, if people want to know who the 200 are, well, that's who they were. But he never forgot that. It was one of those, another one of those moments. So there were several, but they're in his journals, you know. <laughs> and he explains uh, how devastated he was and horrified by human behavior uh, when he found that, uh, that little cemetery to the horses and mules. Yeah, the way that he talks about animals in this book, and you reveal a beautiful story about how he's trying to capture a mouse, but making sure that he saves the life of this little creature. It's just so beautiful. So, <laughs> well, Finley, and in ways reading Ira's book, I began to feel a lot less sympathy for Roth. Not like I started off with a lot of it anyway, but already just reading it, I, I felt a little bit different. Ira, I want to ask you the same question. Did you have one of those definitive moments yourself? Well, I had several. I'm glad to hear that you became less sympathetic to Roth as you went through the book, uh, because he's a difficult individual. There's no question about it. I think one of the moments was uh, first reading a lengthy article by his psychiatrist uh, about narcissism and the artist. And Roth is in that article semi-disguised, but not really disguised. And the psychiatrist who is extremely well known among the art circle in Manhattan, Leonard Bernstein went to him, Adam Gopnik, the writer for the New Yorker went to him. Um, he, uh, he really did identify, I think, what have been some of the primary qualities, negative as well as positive of Roth. And I think from that, I was drawn more to the so-called failings of Roth rather than his successes. But what saves the biographer from turning completely against his subject, this happened to Mark Shore writing a biography of Sinclair Lewis, he hated him by the time he was finished, is Philip Roth's sense of comedy. And the comic voice, the comic tone, not only in his writing, but to his own life is quite remarkable. One quick anecdote. He was living in Connecticut. He had to go by ambulance to the hospital, Lenox Hill Hospital, for cardiac treatment in New York. He was driven by 
a medic and a driver who had never been to New York City in their lives. And this is in about 1980 or something, and they were sure they were going to be mugged. Furthermore, Roth, who's lying on a gurney in the back, had to shout directions to them, okay, while he's on an IV and so forth. So they get to New York and they cannot find the hospital. They know they're in the right neighborhood. So they do what any two ambulance drivers would do. They stop at a crosswalk, they open the back, they slide Roth out and leave him on the street at a crosswalk at Lexington Avenue and 70 something and go away. Well, they had to park the car. And Roth has already won the Pulitzer Prize. And he's very comic and disappointed that no one recognized him tied to a gurney in the middle of this crosswalk in the middle of New York. They finally come back. They were six blocks away. He gets to the hospital. Ira, I got, when I read that part in your book, I literally could not stop laughing because I think it so Good. exemplifies everything you're trying to tell us in this biography about how you see love. And it actually leads really beautifully into the next question, which I think is a gorgeous question from Nika. The question goes like this. As science is recognizing more frequently, the role of the researcher, researcher in research is never entirely objective. How do you view your roles, for example, the potential of your lives, interacting and perhaps influencing this process of writing about the lives of others? Well, it's entirely subjective. I'm, I'm not going to hide that. It's very simple. I was attracted to Roth very, very early on because of his writing and what he wrote about. I, as I said, met him a number of times, um, and I wanted to know more about this person. Now, I also was able to see the negative as well as the positive. And I will say the negative came out repeatedly in his relationship with women. No matter how much he said he loved them, he disliked them at the same time. And this is a very difficult thing to kind of assess. And women in his fiction is also a very complicated topic. And one of the reasons he had that view was he always felt they betrayed him in one form or another. And it goes back to his first wife, who supposedly said she was pregnant, proved it, falsely. She bought a urine sample from a pregnant woman in Tompkins Square Park in New York and showed him the results. And he was constantly being betrayed or deceived. So it's, it's not a simple story. No subject is a simple subject. But of course, the subjectivity. That's why you need to have another biography of the same. Oh, I, I, Maybe yeah, I've, I've said that yeah, repeatedly that even down to the choice of the illustrations, the photographs that you use, you know you're constructing a fiction based on facts, but it's, it's a fiction and it's a fiction, uh, it's an adventure story. In the case of Finley, I say finally, after all his despair, it's a love story and a success story, but he could be really difficult. Now his difficulty had to do with alcohol and um, there are some pretty ugly scenes in which uh, alcohol plays a major role. But coming back to this notion of friendships, he, even though he behaved so badly, the friends who had to deal with this, not to mention Bill, he still kept those friends. It's a mm -hmm. very, very interesting process. I mean, I, I couldn't have lived with him, um, but um, Bill did. And the friends did not betray or abandon him. And, uh, but, that's their Timothy Finley, and my Timothy Finley is another story altogether. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a beautiful question, Ira, that I think really actually follows very beautifully from this conversation that we're having, and it's from Aaron. He wants to ask, thinking of Claudia Roth's peer points, Roth Unbound in particular, I'm curious as to how a biographer must negotiate the stories that have already been written about their subjects. How did you do that? That's a good question, and the answer isn't that difficult. Philip Roth encouraged and directed Claudia Roth Pierpont to do that book. And throughout that book, he's always interrupting and he's saying, no, this is the way it really happened. And she's an excellent writer, a New Yorker writer, and she's, okay, I'm, that's, that's what it's gonna be. I looked at the book when it first came out. I didn't really refer to it much while I was working on my book. And it's perfectly fine for what it is. 
but it's the subject standing behind the writer saying, no, 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 correct that. That's not particularly correct the way you've said it. So I won't call it interference. I call it direction. I don't know what the other biography will be that's coming out next month, but I have a sense there's a shadow that, well, I, yeah, we'll just leave it at that. So you think that's I, how you know. Would you ever want to get together with all these individuals who have all had their different perspective and biography of Oh, Rock? absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, uh, I even know a third person, a historian who is just getting underway uh, with another account of Philip Roth, a very short one. I think it would be wonderful, and it's called dialogue. I find that people working on a particular subject where you have multiple voices are generally, I won't say sympathetic, but understanding of each other's kind of approach. It's uh, subtly competitive, but it's not nasty, okay? So in other words, if I have the address or the, I mentioned this particular person to reach out to me, oh, I'm not gonna give it to you, Manel. I'm very sorry, I know we've just met, but, uh, so they're, we're protective, but not in a nasty way. And I know stories from earlier biographers where they would never suggest any mutuality or similar understanding. So it's, it's a tough field, but there you are. Carol, I want to ask you the same question because I think it does also relate back to, to your story around Finley as well, how a biographer negotiates these stories that have already been written about their subjects. How did you do this? I had uh, less of a problem uh, with other, bi other biographies out there. There was an earlier short biography. Uh, the problem for me was not out there with other biographers on Finley. The problem for me was his own creation of autobiographies at two of them, Inside Memory, which I've mentioned, and it's a marvelous book, and later Journeyman. And both of those books drawing on his memories and his journals, and then the, the, the life story he tells of himself in his journals, right? All of these journals, thousands of pages of journals. So that was exhausting work, and the problem is trying to decide how much you can believe or trust something that the author, in this case, Finley, says in the journals, and how skeptical and careful you have to be. There are lacunae in those journals. So I'm asking myself, all right, there was this terrible scene. You behaved very badly. Uh, I know about that scene from letters and other sources. And you say right here in your journal, Finley, that you'll say something more about what happened, and you don't. Right. You don't. Uh, yeah. So that kind of, you know, it's an absence, and you can't fill it in by making it up. Uh, you have to rely on other things, and you have to be very, I had to be very careful. What would I quote? What selections from uh, these thousands of pages would I choose? The one thing I, I decided to include, and I was, very lucky getting permission from the estate was a picture of him that he drew in one of the journals. I don't know if this will show up, um, Manel, but I'll hold it up to the calendar. It's really quite precious. Uh, it's about himself as the artist working, and he, he made this sketch in the journal uh, when he was working on the wars. I don't know if you can see it. Probably not very well. And for those but, of you who can't see it, it's important. It's a sketch of him kind of perched over his desk. And when I saw this image show, it really moved me mm -hmm. because it showed his commitment towards writing. But even that he saw himself in this way, it was quite moving. Yeah, he, he has his back to the viewer in this self-portrait. So, I mean, that, I mean, one could analyze that endlessly, it seems to me. But, um, yeah, I had to be very selective and very cautious. And of course, somebody else come along and go through those pages, might choose different passages and come up with a different theory or a different perspective on who Timothy Finley was. I think we have time for one last question. I want to make it do this question, which I think is also really lovely. She asks, you touched on this a little, but to what degree is your writing guided by one narrative form or another? I was reading an article about picaresque today, for example. Might a form such as that tempt you? 
It depends. Um, I'll, I'll just say it depends entirely on, on your subject. Uh, my biography of Sharon Pollock has a very different shape from this biography, and these both have a very different shape from my work on Tom Thompson or Mina Benson Hubbard. I mean, it just depends so much on the person, who they were, what they were doing. Uh, and um, there isn't one, one way. I think we've already addressed that. You, you cut the cloth to fit the story you're trying to create given the material that you have. And in my case, ancestors, which always come at the beginning of a biography, are not at the very beginning. Like Ira, I don't want to start with, they came over on the boat in 1830, uh, although they did. Um, uh, so the ancestors have to have a lot of space in this biography. They didn't in Sharon Pollock's, but for Finley, they are absolutely grist for his creative mill. He talks about them all the time, and he bases characters in his novels on these, on these people, on particularly Aunt Ruth, which was a huge discovery and a joy for me to discover. But that's another story. So yeah, you shape it. To find out. On, yeah. <laughs> How about you, Ira? I want to give you the last word to think about and answer. The last that. word. Well, I guess I, I must admit I'm a sort of essentialist in the sense that I look for that signature moment. I don't know what it is, but with all the accounts I've attempted, I, I begin with an event that I think signals uh, an approach to the subject. So it's not that I'm going to be, you know, a romantic or following a picaresque style or something. I want to know um, from an event, how does it symbolize, if that's not too strong a term, the powerful elements of that particular subject. Leonard Cohn begins when he wrote his first poem on the day of his father's funeral, and he took a bow tie of his father's, he cut it in half and he put that poem inside the bow tie and he buried it in his backyard. I still can't believe that. I mean, it's so overpowering. That's how I started. And he read that and he simply said, that's right. So there are moments in people's lives. We don't even know it when they occur to us, but they're, they, they're powerful and they have significance. So there you go. You know, we started off the conversation today talking about motivations, right? Like Cheryl, you talked about how you were really motivated because of understanding your students' motivations. And you've also just led us back to the very same place we started, I arrived by talking about, we'll never really know these motivations, but I wanna thank you both for offering us a space to think about the complexities and the complicities of these motivations today. And it's been such a gift to speak with both of you. I really appreciate your time and generosity today. Well, thank you. You've done a wonderful job. Thank you. It was a delight. Yeah. Very I'd like to add my thanks. Thank you so much, Manel, for such rich, curious questions. And thank you, Cheryl and Ira, for your really provocative, inspiring discussion. And I want to mention as well, we owe a debt of thanks to our co-sponsors, the Department of English, which is where Ira and Cheryl worked for many years, and to UBC's Faculty of Arts. And of course, all for coming and providing, uh, being such a great audience and providing such rich questions. Thank you very much. If you're interested in a videotape that uh, revisits this conversation, we'll post it on our YouTube channel in the next few weeks. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.